Welcome back to New World Next Week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. Your smart bulbs have security flaws. We've got that story plus 3D printing a dead man's finger to break into his phone. But first, over 100 tour nodes found designed to spy on deep web users. This via the Hacker News. Researchers have discovered over 100 malicious nodes on the Tor anonymity network that are misbehaving and potentially spying on dark websites that use Tor to mask the identities of their operators. Two researchers from Northwestern University carried out an experiment on the Tor network for 72 days and discovered at least 110 malicious Tor hidden service directories on the network. The pair introduced around 1,500 honeypot servers, which they called Hunions, Honey Onions, running a framework to expose when a Tor relay with hidden service directory capabilities has been modified to snoop into the hidden services that it currently hosts. After the experiment, conducted between February 12th and April 24th of this year, the researchers gathered and analyzed all the data, revealing the identities of at least revealing they identified rather at least 110 malicious hidden service directories most of them located gosh i thought it was going to be all russia and china us germany france uk and the netherlands the paper titled hunions toward detection and identification of misbehaving tor hidden service directories describes the researchers work in detail and is going to be presented next week at the 24th annual defcon security conference James, I think in keeping with our name in almost seven years of New World Next Week, I think this episode brings things all very much coming to the future, and it's now. The future or the past? I mean, this is a story that's uh, that's not exactly a breaking, shocking news to people who have been following security issues for over the years, and I'll just throw in a few links. Um, there was an article last year, Can You Trust Tor's Exit Nodes on NakedSecurity.Sophos.com? The answer, unsurprisingly, is no. Um, and also, I mean, even the official story, the official explanation, the official approved you know, stamp of approval about Tor and what it is, of course, it was created by the U.S. government so that the U.S. government could use it for its own purposes for encrypted communications, and it works better if everyone uses it, so let's promote it. And that's uh, the, the story that's put forward in articles like this one from Network World. No conspiracy theory needed, Tor created for U.S. government spying that uh, points to a Cryptome.org um, email exchange that was posted on Cryptome, including one of the founders of Tor saying, yeah, I mean, the U.S. government was looking for ways to create an encrypted network that they could use for their own spies and things of that sort, sort and that's why they, they want people to use it, because it's better when more people use it. And then, of course, there's the, uh, the, the story from 2014. There was a hack attack on uh, Tor trying to unmask people's anonymity, um, with regards to Silk Road. And yes, uh, it was suspected that came from the U.S. government, although there was no hard proof of it until earlier this year when some unsealed court documents found U.S. government-funded Carnegie Mellon research to locate Silk Road suspect. So that's all in the bank. We all we know about all of this. Um, if you suspect that Tor is going to be the be-all and end-all for privacy, anonymity, and security for you, then You've been sold a bill of goods. Um, it's only as good as the people running the uh, the HS d directories and the, the exit relays and all of the vulnerable points of the system. And um, uh, that that's pretty much it. In fact, if anything, it's a good way to, to put a big red flag over your activity if you're using Tor, because that's probably the stuff that the government's going to be looking at even harder and trying to uh, f find out who you are even more. So... Uh, I don't know. Trust these these types of technologies as far as you can throw them and always look at where they come from. I personally like that the logo is an onion, as though it's sort of security satire. <laughs> Their next story on episode 278 of New World Next Week in a very futuristic episode, we take it from ZDNet. Serious security flaws found in Osram smart bulbs. Researchers have found that popular home lighting system Osram Lightify has a number of severe security flaws that could leave users vulnerable to attack, which, if fully exploited, could allow an attacker to pivot access into an internal network. One of the worst flaws could allow an attacker to take control of a product in order to launch attacks against a browser. Another severe weakness in the smart home device allows an attacker to identify the wireless network's password. Osram, a Germany-based company, indicated that the next round of patches coming next week would fix all the flaws with the exception of two lesser flaws. Such a strange story. And again, James, I like the way that over these years we've been able to sort of lay out the future as it's coming. What a mundane 
thing to bring so much potential trouble into your home. Oh, I got in through your smart light bulb, and now I completely control your whole smart grid. Feels kind of dumb, James. Quote, is Byron in for a rude awakening? There is already an organization, a human one, known as Phoebus, the International Light Bulb Cartel, headquartered in Switzerland. Run pretty much by International GE, OSRAM, and Associated Electrical Industries of Britain, which are in turn owned 100%, 29%, and 46%, respectively, by the General Electric Company in America. Phoebus fixes the prices and determines the operational lives of all the bulbs in the world, from Brazil to Japan to Holland, although Philips in Holland is the mad dog of the cartel, apt at any time to cut loose and sow disaster through the great combination. Given this state of general repression, there seems no place for a newborn baby bulb to start, but at the bottom. But Phoebus doesn't know yet that Byron is immortal. End quote. That, of course, from Thomas Pynchon's Gravity's Rainbow, which has this bizarre 10 page digression about a sentient talking light bulb that is being hunted down by the Phoebus cartel because it is immortal <laughs> and I I vividly remember reading this this book and it's a weird book in so many ways but I remember reading that book and seeing that passage about Byron the Bulb and thinking this is the craziest most like what was he smoking to come up with this and yet here we are with these smart bulbs that are in everyone's homes literally spying on all of your activities in the home that are now vulnerable points of attack for hackers that are going to take over your house through your light bulb. We are living in gravity's rainbow level craziness and it is becoming reality. So I don't know. I'll just direct people over to, uh, I've got a section on this Byron the Bulb that people can go read through and the, the light bulb conspiracy that Pension documents in Gravity's Rainbow that was 100% true. The Phoebus cartel, all of that, absolutely 100% true facts. Um, and it's getting even worse because now it's not just a cartel for planned obsolescence. It's a cartel that literally has the keys to your home in the key sense. And uh, that's crazy. Anyway, side note, might, might be a good uh, candidate for FLNWO. I don't know if I'll subject people to Gravity's Rainbow. It's a really big book, but The Crying of Lot 49 would be right up FLNWO's alley. We'll, we'll put that as a sidebar, as a, as a deprogramming note, James. Uh, Thomas Pinchon, of course, it's also worth noting, Simpsons guest star. We'll include all of these notes, again, everything we say and play, always included down in the show notes, so you can click and follow and do more research for yourself. Never take our word for it. We just kind of pay attention and try and share the information. So, James, if you took us to strange gravity's rainbow areas, I think our third and final story this week will pretty much just cap it all off. Police 3D print murder victim's finger to unlock his phone. This via The Verge. Police in Michigan have a new tool for unlocking phones, 3D printing. Law enforcement officers approached a professor at Michigan State earlier this year to reproduce a murder victim's fingerprint from a pre-recorded scan. Once created, the 3D model would be used to create a false fingerprint, which could be used to unlock the phone. Because the investigation is ongoing, details are limited, and it's unclear whether the technique will even be successful. Still, it is similar to techniques researchers have used in the past to recreate working fingerprint molds from scanned images, often in coordination with law enforcement. This, however, might be the first confirmed case of police using the technique to unlock a phone in an active investigation. Uh, can we add in before we even get into this, James? They're related. Hey, but, uh, you know, Snowden made the new contraption to fit over your iPhone as well. So the phone wars are, are definitely on, and this reminds me of, I can't think of it, I, I tried to even look for an image earlier. There's some sci-fi movie, I'm sure, where Arnold Schwarzenegger has somebody's hand that's been chopped off, and he uses it to get the fingerprints to open the door and save the world or whatever. So again, sci-fi is, is now. Was that Total Recall or a different one? I don't know. But yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about. And yeah, here's the underlying point of this. If some hacker steals your password you change your password. If some hacker steals your fingerprints, what do you do exactly? This is one of the very key underlying problems with the idea of biometric security, let alone how creepy and Orwellian and all of this is and where it's going, where you're going to have to scan your fingerprint to get on the internet and all of that kind of stuff that's coming, you know, coming down the line. But 
just from a security perspective, just from an operational perspective, if someone manages to duplicate your fingerprint or iris uh, scan or whatever it is, then what do you do about that? Do you go about changing your fingerprint somehow? No, of course you can't do that. It's Once it's compromised, it's compromised forever. And it's apparently pretty easy to compromise. So uh, yeah, just another thing to think about when uh, biometrics continues to become the rage. Well, James, it might be coming even sooner than you think. As we wrap up this episode 278 of New World Next Week, a couple of quick headlines we're looking at using hashtag New World Next Week. And again, a lot of these headlines, if not all of these headlines, have been crowdsourced. They've been submitted by you. Shinzo Abe fires up the printing presses to further inflate an artificial economy as Japan plans a stimulus package of more than 28 trillion yen. Trudeau buckles like a belt for the military-industrial complex as Canada ditches Boeing after Lockheed threatens 10,000 jobs. And ICIASIS continues to stage Gladio-style attacks on Europe, leading, of course, to having German officials call to change that pesky constitution after the Munich shooting. But, James, I also just saw the CFR, the Council on Foreign Relations, talking up Obama's new I-11 plan, I-911 plan, that is, unveiled today, which essentially looks like it puts the FBI in charge of responding to cyber attacks. But that is fresh news for today, and I haven't had time to research that, and we'll have to save that for another episode of New World Next Week. Yo, goody. All right. All right. <laughs> All right, on that note, well, obviously we're back, and we'll be back again next week, right? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's uh, continue to do the uh, do the work of documenting all of this craziness, and uh, well, hopefully, giving people a leg up on what's coming down the pike. All right, buddy. Take care. <laughs>